Hello and welcome to Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures, Talking It Out, the first in the repository of the Undercommons series of online events. The repository of the Undercommons, ROTU, is an art collective whose concept comes from many places, pleasures and pains. Thoughts unspoken, whispers, theories and shouts of joy as well as rage. It comes from all of us and us all, from our repositories. We understand as artists, we're also workers, constrained by systems over which we have little to no control. However, we can and should make political work or work informed by politics. ROTU are currently forming as a network of anti-capitalist, degrowth and decolonial artists for mutual assistance, to share ideas and establish a space which shakes up our understanding of the present and the past and creates opportunities for us to generate new vocabularies of social organisation and build better ways to create and live together. Since the COVID-19 crisis took hold, ROTU are pursuing Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures, a collective programme designed to put people into contact with art, creating and making, alongside the practice of liberation and building practical solidarity with today's struggles. ROTU and Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures is led in, in ROTU and Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures is led in collaboration with me, Leila Roxanne, a curator, writer and organiser, Chris, Fadzai, Jamie, Nalini, Nusheen and Ruben of Verbena Blue Collective as a current cohort of artists. Though we'd hoped for our Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures series of events to take place IRL or in real life, due to the ongoing crises, both related to COVID and not, this will not be possible. However, as a group made up of individuals who are used to adapting, we plan to undertake encountering crisis and remaking futures in a combination of off and online practices. Each Rotu's, Rotu member's contribution will be released over the month of October for you to tune into. When they're available, the links will be shared in the description below and on Instagram, the link for which is also below. Also in the description box is a link to a form we've created for you to be able to put questions to us ahead of a live event scheduled for early November. We hope you enjoy listening to Encountering Crisis and Remaking Futures Talking It Out, which will introduce you to who we are and what we're about and the events which will follow. Thank you. Firstly, we're going to be hearing from Roto member Chris Manson, a writer and artist whose genre fiction visual storytelling draws heavily from his mixed Scottish-Chinese heritage. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leila. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So, uh, like Leila said, I'm a writer and artist. Uh, I primarily work in comic art. I do a lot of fiction that explores my own cultural heritage uh, of uh, being mixed race, Chinese and Scottish, what that means to me, how that interacts with other people and other concepts. And really a lot of my work, I, I take great delight in uh, celebrating the kind of mundane little unique bits and pieces that kind of make my, my experience of life unique and interesting. And I try and share that feeling and sensation out with everyone else. And kind of part of um, my, uh, my, my background as well is uh, in um, engineering and technology. And uh, I have previously worked in the renewables industry and that's um, driving a lot of what I'm doing here in row two. Um, it's one, one of our, our main concerns has always been the environment and uh, the management of growth and everything and I think that uh, my my project has really allowed me to combine literally the whole of myself into um, into something tangible that I can produce and share with other people so you know it's, it's a very exciting opportunity. I'm glad to hear it. Um, since the pandemic took hold the repository of the Undercommons focus has moved away from presenting works for COP26, which was a big event scheduled to take place in Glasgow um, this November, um, highlighting climate challenges, climate change, and what we can do to address that particular crisis. Um, but now our body of work has shifted um, to encountering crisis and remaking futures. 
So taking from the title, what has your experience of this crisis and any additional crises um, related to the pandemic been? So, uh, yeah, like everyone else, I, I've been impacted by the lockdown. Um, uh, I've been very fortunate health-wise that I've, uh, I've not been directly affected by the virus myself, although I do have uh, friends who have been um, frontline health workers um, as well. So it's been um, kind of a tough time um, psychologically and socially because you're always worried you're always concerned and you're always trying to make sure that you're taking enough care not just for yourself but for others as well your friends your family the general public around you and I kind of for the first few months I really felt locked in because I've been working from home for for several months uh, in my day job obviously with um uh, cancellations of large events. I've not been able to get out to do comic conventions and things. So it, it almost feels like um, artistically, my my career has been frozen. And I think that, that that's something I share with a great many other comic creators as well. So projects like Row 2 and other kind of smaller things that uh, we've all been pitching in on um, along the way, I think it helps. It's It's our own way of surviving. And uh, which, which is, I suppose, is a very human thing, isn't it? It's we we've been limited in what we can do by this 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 shared experience that we all have to deal with, and we're all dealing with in slightly different ways. But having having something to look forward to, to be able to work on with colleagues, with friends, without exposing ourselves and others to to the risks of the virus, it's that that's kind of what keep, what's been keeping me afloat these last few months is is being able to look forward to making and sharing art. Yep and that relates to another well, part of the question I was going to ask is what has supported you to hold your imagination you know in a time where as I said people have felt both locked in um, whilst being locked down so what do you feel has maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on what has supported you to hold your imagination and your your hope I mean, I have a very long backlog of ideas that I need to work on anyway. Um, so um, I guess it's been easy for me to uh, to pick stuff uh, to go, oh, well, okay, I've not got any conventions coming up, so I might as well work on this. Um, because when I do conventions, I tend to do a lot of smaller prints and badges and things as well, uh, kind of merchandise. Um, but obviously with, uh, with that uh, not happening, I've kind of had, had to poke myself into disciplined shape and actually start working longer form uh, comic stories. Um, and I guess trying to, trying to maintain a vision outside of a life outside of the COVID lockdown. I mean, I know in my heart that it's not ending anytime soon, but at the same time, being able or trying to make myself be able to plan beyond that, even though we don't know when it's going to end. At some point, I do want to continue making art and telling stories, and I want to do so in kind of more more formal circumstances, if you know what I mean. So rather than uh, just self-publishing, um, which is a fine endeavor unto itself, but I'd like to expand my reach. I'd like to 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 tell my story to more people and uh, share those experiences as far as I can. So I guess, yeah, uh, ultimately, I, I, I find a lot of enjoyment in my art and I find a lot of hope as well, not just in the subject matter, but just in the fact that it exists. These ideas are already there in my, in my mind and I feel like I kind of owe it to myself and to the ideas to keep on going, to keep on producing and to make progress. Whether or not anybody actually sees it, at least I'll have expressed them and gotten them into... Uh, a format that I can share if I uh, if I want to if I choose to and I think just picking up on what you've said there that in itself feels like a form of resistance to you know the capitalist regime that has ramped up you know more mm -hmm. formal work settings so to be able to produce like on your own terms like to me that sounds and feels like resistance um to to the capitalist forces um that seem to be surviving quite well mm. at this moment in time and that's the thing it's um you know i no, nobody is currently paying me to to produce these things they're they're my ideas and i'm 
I just want to get them out there. I would ultimately like to be paid for these things. I'd like to say, make a living wage out of my art, but you know, it's, I still want to express the ideas and I still want to share the messages because uh, I, I find particularly comic art um, through my artwork, I've linked up with other mixed race creators. And I found that, you know, we, we have a lot of similarities and that makes me feel great because um, there, there's not a huge number of mixed Scottish Chinese people around me in general. It's basically me, and my sister. Um, every once in a while, I'll run into somebody, um, and you know we'll we'll, we'll have a lot to, to talk about. But um, unless we move in the same circles, um, we we tend not to to keep in touch. Whereas with um, with comic art, I've met people from from all over the world who have very similar experiences to me and who also have very different experiences from me uh, that's that's the power of of telling stories that's the power of arts so thinking about crisis and the future how have you countered or encountered crisis both now and in the past and how do you see yourself remaking in what feels like a potentially crisis filled future <laughs> <laughs> that that's the thing i don't know if it's just because we're we're better connected you know uh, information wise than ever now it feels like they're like you say there's there's a crisis happening all the time um obviously right now it's uh covid and there's a, a fresh war that's been started uh, uh in um, uh, the caucuses um there's you know uh uh, still lingering resentment from various you know the uh, wars and crackdowns that we've had um you know since i was a child um and I, yeah it it just feels like our positivity and our ability to 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 do things has just taken a terrible beating over the last sort of two to three decades and you know that that uh, that's just my personal lifespan uh, if you look back there's a never-ending torrent of bad things happening um, and I, I guess everyone has their own responses and um, one of the things that I do cover in the um, the the project that I'm working on for uh, for the series of videos is that for a lot of people their response is to just retreat into their own shell. And that's not a judgment. That's just an observation because people's lives are complicated enough. Why, why invite additional complexity in uh, if you feel that you can't control it, if you can't fight back against it? And I feel that's why people, people, people are becoming numbed to a lot of, a lot of crisis because Either they're happening more frequently, which I think there is a case for that, or we're getting notified of of them and we're going into detail of them more. And I think what we really need to do, or what needs to be done on our behalf, is we need to see the hope. We need to see positivity. We need to know that, one, we can have an impact on things, and two, that ultimately we can make things better. And I think a lot of a lot of what we're feeling right now is is despair, and that's built up over time, and it kind of it 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 suits certain narratives. And I'm not talking about conspiracy theories where you know shadowy governments or puppet masters to everyone. No, it's um, the fact is that groups of people will tend to try and maintain control and power where they have it and they'll do what they need to do and they don't consider it you know particularly wrong or evil or anything because to them that's just survival it's a very human thing we all do the same in kind of different circumstances but we also need to consult our ethics and generally the decisions that we make as individuals don't have the same ethical implications as the decisions made at higher levels so um i, I guess to, to kind of round up my long and meandering point um what what i personally am trying to do with with my work with my artwork is just to, to tell stories to entertain people to try and jog people's 
you know, sense of hope and happiness and joy. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean telling schmaltzy, sugary stories all the time. Um, you know, if, if you engage with people with storytelling, if you give them well-crafted characters that they can identify, people whose flaws they share or, you know, you just tell them an entertaining story that distracts them for a while, that's also great. Um, and if you, you know, if you stop people from thinking about the terribleness that surrounds us at all times right now, it, it gives them a bit of a rest. It's a bit of respite. And when people are rested from despair, then hopefully they'll move towards hope and knowing that they can make a difference and knowing that they can get to a place where things are better for everyone. I, I hope that like within the collective, you know, it's like we encourage each other to undertake an exploration of, you know, our practices which are freeing, provocative, and which centers collective liberation. Um, I'm going to ask you here, how realistic do you personally think that this is? And can you give any examples of this during your time with Roto? Oh, definitely. Like, um, as a collective, we all feed into each other's work and we all feed off each other's work as well. Um, just uh, in the, the, the kind of year that we've been active so far, I've learned so much about um, about being an artist. Um, because comics is its own little bubble, almost. We, we're all artists and we're all writers. We all have our own craft, but there's less kind of cross communication than you would think with other branches of art uh, when, whenever we talk between disciplines we learn and we you know we we gain something from that both sides gain from that um i uh, when we went up to Ullapool, uh last year uh fudge took me around the galleries in Ullapool and showed me her work there uh, and she gave me a lot of great information about interacting with galleries and using the spaces there and you know, just general approach to to art as an uh, as an exhibition and kind of in return i've shared uh, technical knowledge with fudge um, i've um, uh, kind of helped fudge out with um, learning how to to record things to to broadcast them to share them online and you know if if we hadn't been put in touch by uh, being part of row two um you know we, we we wouldn't know the things that we know now we we wouldn't have grown as much as we have as artists next up we're going to be hearing from row two member nilini paul um, nilini is a poet born in india raised in canada and residing in scotland um i think it'd be really helpful for everyone if you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you come sure. from Thank you so much. Thanks, Leila. Um, so, as Leila said, my name is Nalini Paul, and yeah, so a bit about my journey. I was born in India and I grew up in Vancouver in Canada, and now I've been living in Scotland. I live in Glasgow right now, and I've lived here in Scotland in different places for most of my adult life, and that includes a year in Orkney about 10 years ago, uh, where I was the George Mackay Brown Writing Fellow. And that was an incredible experience, which I think has definitely influenced my work um, and what, what I would now call my research outputs, because I currently work as a lecturer at the Glasgow School of Art for two different departments. And I'm mainly um, doing uh, year four supervisions where I help the year four students uh, with their written work and shaping their research and so on. But I also teach a, a third year elective course on post-colonial theory. So I've got a background in post-colonial theory, which perhaps is not surprising. Um, and I did a PhD at Glasgow University um, some time ago. Uh, and that was on the, it was a post-colonial analysis of the novels of Jean Rhys. And she's a, a white West Indian writer who wrote a prequel to Jane Eyre, and it tells the story of the mad woman in the attic from a, a different perspective, where we get to meet her as a child and find out about her life and what led to her um, unfortunate demise. So I had a lot of fun with that, if that's the right word, with that thesis looking at issues of identity, belonging, subjectivity, how our identities change according to different situations. Um, 
it was very uh, theory heavy, theory based, but I, I really love that approach. My first degree was in philosophy and English literature. So I, I just take naturally to, to that abstract, I suppose, way of um, framing texts and more. And so I used a lot of um, post-colonial theory, such as Homi Baba's theory of the ambivalent I and the this inherent split within the self um, that exists in a colonizer colonized dynamic. Um, and I also looked at some uh, theories from uh, Jacques Lacan and mirroring and feminist French theory from Julia Kristeva and, and various uh, formulations around looking and gazing and um, identity and power and how these things shift and change. So when I finished my thesis more than a decade ago, I kind of thought that that would be it, but um, a series of events have taken place since then. And through my own writing and poetry, including the year in Orkney, I found ways of um, articulating my research for lack of a better phrase. So I find that these theories were not something so separate to my own life and to my own creative output as at the time I thought they perhaps would be. So when I was doing the PhD, I saw that very much as, you know, here's the academic work, here's the really uh, difficult but enjoyable stuff. And here's the creative side, the poetry where I get to go frolicking into the wilderness. And at one point during the, that time I lived in a, my partner and I lived in a farm cottage in South Lanarkshire. So, you know, there was a, a lot of frolicking in the, in the wilderness. There's a lot of that, you know, closeness to nature and writing poems about nature and our connection or lack of connection there too. However, since then, in the last, I don't know how many years, few years, I suppose, five to 10, I suppose, since I got back from Orkney more than 10 years ago, uh, various artistic collaborations for stage with dancers, um, visual artists, and so on have, um, as I look back on all of that, I realized that um, these projects really did bring the theory and all the stuff that I explored in my PhD into the creative practice, maybe not in definitely not in a self-conscious way, and I wouldn't, you know, necessarily encourage that. However, these issues around race and belonging were always there. So that that's been my journey so far, and the project that I'm doing now um, looks at landscape and walking in natural and so-called wild spaces, and how that can affect the individual sense of belonging or lack of belonging how these things might change through what we would call a phenomenological experience. And that is the lived physical in the moment experience that we have through the senses that we experience through our various senses as we're walking in a landscape and what better place to feel alive than to be, you know, walking along the coast, say somewhere in Orkney when the wind is blowing a gale and <laughs> almost, almost a gale. I once had an experience with that. And, um, you know, and all the, the elements um, bring a sense of life to the experience. And, and um, these are the th things, the kinds of things I've been exploring with the project. Um, I'm taking that in a slightly um, nuanced, in a more nuanced direction where I'm also looking at race and belonging and identities. And is this experience for the individual um, going to be different if that individual happens to be a woman, happens to be a so-called BAME woman. What are these experiences, um, you know, how do they differ? Because often in, in philosophy, which as I said was my, my first degree with, with English Lit, we'll look at such things as, you know, any experience that race doesn't tend to, in those days anyway, when I was studying it, race never came into it. So so Nagel did, wrote a very famous article um, called, What is it like to be a bat? And that's very much about uh, this uh, ep um, epiphenomenal, I think he uses that phrase, uh, experience of being. And there are many other um, philosophers such as Hegel who talk about you know, being and Dasein and what, what does that mean? That feeling of, of being alive, of existing, what does that actually mean? However, none of those questions or postulations that are fascinating and wonderful to explore 
do they ever take race into account and 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 question whether such a design or such a you know what is it likeness a qualia which is what Nagel calls it this qualia of being ha is that different for different people depending on their backgrounds depending on their race all of which all of these things uh, of which are are socially constructed so um so he will talk about, you know, bats. We can never imagine what it is like to be a bat because we aren't bats, because we don't have the same um, perceptual framework. So we can only ever imagine ourselves imagining what it's like to be a bat. So we can't get into the physical space, into that uh, phenomenological space, which, which many philosophers would argue is different. Um, but it, but they but they recognize that for humanity there's this universalizability or this universal experience. What what Kant refers to as universalizability and Spivak. So I know I'm going off in many directions here, but I'll just bring this back um, to the beginning, back to um, so we can go to the next question, perhaps. Um, Spivak, uh, <coughs> excuse me, another important um, a female. Um, uh, a, a woman um, post-colonial theorist who has written some groundbreaking work, including a very uh, uh, significant essay, Three Women's Texts and a Critique of, of Imperialism. She takes um, issue with Kant, who, as a male philosopher of centuries ago during the Enlightenment, um, made claims around something that unites us as humans, which is this ability to create um, moral laws based on what we feel is the greater good part. I'm paraphrasing Kant here, not exactly, but what but he is saying it's not to do necessarily with the greater good for the greater number of people, but that's more a utilitarian view. But he was saying that in, a, in the sense of universalizability, it's the idea that you can only um, uh, act on any on any actions that you might um, create a rule by and what he calls a maxim and you must only act on an, any maxim that you believe can be made into universal law so how th there's a huge problem with that because universal laws immediately uh, disregard any sense of diversity so that's a bringing it right up to date with the kind of language that we, you know, that key word, which we hear buzzing around us all the time in a very sometimes irritating way because people just chuck it about diversity. What, you know, what does that actually mean? Um, but it really, it doesn't recognize that. Um, so this idea that there's a universal law just, you know, suggests that we're all the same. So that these are the kinds of issues I want to explore. Also looking at folklore, I'm really interested in myth and my, <clears throat> excuse me, most recent uh, poetry collection pamphlet, um, booklet uh, of, of a few years ago now, uh, The Raven Song, that takes poems, sorry, it, it right, there's a, it's a book of poems inspired by myths and stories that are based on um, crows and ravens. So raven and crow myths and stories from Orkney, Shetland and British Columbia, where I grew up. I grew up in Vancouver in British Columbia. And interestingly, over at least the last maybe 10 or more years, I've learned more and more uh, about some of the indigenous cultures there, which when I was growing up, we received a very um, simplified version of their stories and histories. We didn't really get a sense of their true histories. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's quite an emotional experience now. That's another issue. Um, so yeah, I think there are all kinds of things to explore. What I've been working on most recently for the project is a book that is um, set in an alternate time and it's deeply inspired in terms of landscapes and the physicality of landscapes uh, from my, by my experience in Orkney this year that I spent there. So whenever I'm writing it, often I'll picture the seascapes and landscapes. So it's set in a time that uh, you don't discover what this time is, and, um, uh, perhaps you do towards the end, or there are clues towards it. And there's a female protagonist and she's lost 
a lot of her sense of language. She's lost, um, she remembers things, she remembers things about her mother, things that her mother taught her, a lot of uh, words, and she's in this strange, well, it is a dystopian society whereby language is only, certain words um, are only possessed by certain people. So there's this hierarchy of language in this social structure and language really does equal power in the society as it does in, in any society. Um, and certain words are banned and she has all kinds of memories and flashbacks and they inform the story as it moves along. And some of that is inspired by myths of uh, ravens and crows. So I'll briefly say before, <laughs> before I just end this part um, that why ravens and crows? So in a lot of um, Norse mythology, the raven or the crow um, was seen as this portent of, of evil of death and despair. What happens is she's wearing a red dress and a raven leers her through this landscape eventually to the edge of a deep loch and she falls in and drowns and they find, the parents find, her red dress floating on the surface of the loch and then see her body and it's a really horrific thing but then he sees this raven flying off and that's the mother of the chicks that he stole. So that mother raven has um, decided, well, you stole my children so I've stolen your child. So that's the that's this retribution that is paid against the raven. Whereas in British Columbia, the um, Haida um, people, indigenous people who live uh, on what is what used to be known as the Queen Charlotte Islands, but was renamed not so long ago as Haida Gwaii. Um, the these one of the a lot of the stories there around the raven portray the raven as this trickster who is really funny and cheeky, has this endless appetite, always gets what he wants and uses humans as pawns to get what he wants, but he can transform himself. So that's what I find really inspiring about those myths is that he can change form and become whatever he wants to suit his own ends. So I, I like this idea of transformation and how being in a landscape and you know, language and poetry, especially, and how it might respond to uh, landscapes and how it might try to articulate our experiences of landscapes, how that language can lead to the sense of transformation. I find that really exciting and empowering. We are recording. We are live. Sweet. Next up, we're going to be hearing from Rotu member Jamie Temple. Jamie is an artist, printmaker and educator whose practice is rooted in printmaking and woodworking, from which he creates architectural and landscape inspired works on paper and site specific installations. So Jamie, um, firstly, thanks for agreeing to speak with me and for coming on this. Um, lovely to see you, hear you and to be speaking with you. Um, so I thought what might be quite good is if you just introduce yourself, give everyone a little sense of who you are, where you're coming from, and well, just however it is you want to describe yourself. Um, yeah, so I am an artist and printmaker. I'm from Forest um, and studied both art and design in Glasgow and then later London. Um, so since finishing studying I, my focus has been on just developing my practice as a printmaker and a fine artist um, a lot of my work is quite architectural uh, a lot of it just comes from these different ideas of like modernism and brutalism and the social structures around these constructed environments but also uh, thinking about the uh, natural landscapes that I both grew up in which I've always been quite inspired by and how these different landscapes that are constructed or natural crossover how people engage with these different landscapes and yeah recently I've been doing a lot of residencies where I've just been kind of researching and developing these ideas and experimenting with different ways of creating artworks. So I'd be making lots of different relief prints, liner prints, combining them with different print making processes to create artworks on paper, but also creating more architectural sculptures with wood. And I think recently in the last couple of months also experiment a bit with ceramics. I think that's where I'm at now. And in terms of where you're at, 
Um, where are you located at the moment? Uh, right now, I'm in Deptford in London. Um, so I was here in London doing a residency just before the lockdown started. So I had planned to go back to Scotland, but I've been kind of locked down in London. So now I'm here just kind of back to this residency, which I'm going to finish up and then hopefully I can move around, get back to kind of moving around a bit. Well, thank you for that introduction. And speaking of pandemics, since the pandemic took hold, um, the repository of Undercommons Focus has moved away from you know, presenting works for COP26 um, to be more focused like on a body of work related to encountering crisis and remaking futures. Just to touch upon that and taken from the title, what has your experience of this crisis and you know any additional crises which are related to the pandemic been? Uh, yeah, so when I, when the kind of lockdown first happened here, my work was kind of, I lost all of my work instantly. So uh, I teach a lot. I always find it like really important for me to teach alongside making work and showing work. I would also like to like get people involved in the making process so they can kind of better understand both the process of how the art's made, but also um, uh, gain like a deeper understanding of the, the themes and the content of the work itself. So kind of in an instant, um i wasn't able to teach anymore so that's kind of really really like foundationally well, kind of changed like the way that i have to approach work particularly trying to make an income i know this is kind of similar for so many people um so I kind of feel like everyone is encountering this pandemic in the same like in their own ways but everyone's kind of in it together so I, I think I have this kind of I feel like I've encountered it and I kind of lost all my work but I can still like accept that I'm quite lucky uh in quite like a privileged position that uh I am able to keep making stuff I think it's really hard to think about how you're going to kind of remake because we're still living in like such like an unknown we don't really know what's going to happen a month or two months from now. I guess like on a personal level, like my work, I've shifted to working in very different ways. So I've kind of used this time to actually learn a lot of new skills that will hopefully be quite useful in the future for making new artwork. Um, but also I've kind of shifted from making visual work because I can't make the large scale stuff that I want to make. I've kind of shifted to writing and through that process of kind of writing more, I'm kind of finding new ways of like taking the research and the content of my road to project and using writing as like a better way to kind of get these ideas and themes across to people. I just really want to be able to, at some point in the near future, get back to teaching workshops where I can move away from the workshops that I was doing before, which were so process driven to creating workshops where I can take the content of the projects and run workshops where I can really engage people in the ideas and the themes that relate to everything in, in just all of the themes that are in the work that I'm making, which are centered around different themes that we as a group in Rotor are kind of approaching. So I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I kind of have my hopes of what I would like to do. And it's just this kind of process of like, I guess making it up as I go along, <laughs> taking what opportunities there are and like using what opportunities I have to share ideas and engage people in ideas around the climate emergency and why it's important that we think about these things. What has supported you to hold your imagination during this time? Uh, I, well, definitely our, our weekly or bi-weekly uh, meetings that we have, um, because when, when the lockdown happened, I had two housemates here and both of them are from Europe and they both went back to their families. So I was in a flat by myself for about five months. And I think these meetings that we have like quite regularly were a good kind of like group uh, a group thing that I can like engage in like a discussion and like hear about everyone else's projects, hear how everyone else is doing, like just what the situation is in Scotland and 
um, feel kind of connected to something. Otherwise, like I think I would have just been sitting in this flat by myself, going a bit mental, <laughs> um, trying to think what to work on. Uh, I think I was also lucky that I had a couple of projects before that I'd started thinking about and started working on. So it's kind of finding ways to rethink those and like do them in a way that I can I can create this stuff from home. So I was working with a, a band to take their uh, the content of their record and the music itself and be inspired by that and my discussions with them to create new work. So I kind of treated that like a residency throughout. And through doing that, I've ended up making like videos and animations and prints and generated quite a lot of stuff. And without a project like that to think about, I would have, I think I would have struggled to find some focus or inspiration. So that's been pretty great. One of the things I was like really surprised at, you know, it's like they were never compulsory, like nobody had to attend them. But on most occasions, it's like we all showed up. And I think like that reflected um, the experience of isolation um, that a lot of people, you know, had experienced at the start of this and you know, continue to experience now. I think for the, 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 the work that I do, I think it's kind of hard because like I, I, I'm so used to and I put like such like a focus on this kind of like personal, like one-to-one -one or group interactions that are face-to-face. So I think it's kind of harder for some people to interact, like for me, for sure, like with when everything shifted to online, I find like I can always like engage people in different ideas, like in person, but also like the other side, some people, some people that I know that like have do similar thing to me, they've like been able to like transition online to like doing workshops or courses online where they can engage more people than they ever have before. Like, cause face-to-face -face interactions for like teaching or like drawing or printmaker are usually like, restricted to like a class size of like, I don't know, six to 10 people. Whereas now you can like have a Zoom uh, discussion really easily or a workshop online where you could have hundreds of people from all over the world that can just kind of join together and engage in like different ideas. So I think there's lots of scope for us, I think, like if we weren't in this situation, we wouldn't be as a group. We wouldn't have kind of engaged in the same way that we have as a group and kind of had these meetings where we talked about all the different themes that are in each of our projects and like all of there's such a diverse group of people as well that I probably wouldn't have been a part of seeing on a regular basis. So it's been great to kind of like, as for us as a group to kind of be inspired by everyone else's background and like the different contexts that people are coming from. So I think that's, yeah, it's strange. It's like some things are like more restricted, but like also there's like so much more scope. It's like you said, like opportunity comes from crisis and there's so much opportunity and we're in a position where we can like make the most of that opportunity to get like different me messages across. So next up, we're going to be hearing from Roto member Nusheen Khwaja. Nusheen is an artist, designer, tech and filmmaker, given enough time. Um, so Nusheen, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're coming from, what your practice is, and yep, just however it is that you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, so yes, uh, I'm many things. And uh, the continuing thread throughout the last 25 years of being a practicing artist has been um, community activism and uh, fostering and helping the growth of other artists, specifically um, women of colour, through my work with Digital Desperados and Glitch Film Festival. And uh, that was a few years. I feel like I'm going to go backwards. So uh, yeah, Glitch Film Festival ran for four years. We had two editions. And after art school, it struck me that I, well, even during, during art school, it struck me that we weren't being taught about artists of color. And so that just started a kind of lifelong process of just trying to find out more information through various mediums, film, filmmakers and through people that I work with and just connecting everything continuously. I'm many things. 
and uh, my background was actually in design and illustration. But whilst at art school, I got into, I guess, tech and installations and just afterwards started teaching myself how to film and uh, working with sound and then evolving into performance. And uh, throughout this whole process and over the last 25 years, I've also continuously researched and educated myself and other artists of colour because um, we weren't really taught about people in art school. You know, it was all, it was, most, it was white centred. And I'd like to think things are different now, hopefully. Um, I mean, certainly with um, the, younger, the younger lot coming up from London, studying at Glasgow School of Art and just being more actively political is really great. Uh, my connections were mostly in Europe and um, America and Canada, talking about folk artists. And um, that's how I sustained myself, forming collaborations and doing performance pieces and um, film and uh, lots and lots of community activism. Again, probably about 20 years and just having various kind of non-art workshops and various kind of women's health festivals and just uh, creative ways of activism. And uh, eventually, well, after, after moving up north and spending five years building a house, which gave me an immense amount of skills and uh, ways of living on the land, um, we started... My partner and I started Digital Desperados, which was a free filmmaking course for women of colour. And uh, that took up a fair chunk of my, my life and uh, drew women from all over the world. And they were saying the same things. It's like, although they had radical politics and uh, were from places that had lots of black indigenous people of colour, they still felt isolated in their communities. and. Um, coming together in this hothouse environment that created was just incredibly empowering and intense. And it was just such an amazing privilege to be able to create a space like that and to be inspired. And uh, from that grew Glitch Film Festival, which was, uh, we screened and curated films and performances by people of colour, queer people of colour, but they didn't, the actual filmmakers didn't have to be queer, it was, this, it was the content, which was also quite different. Um, Glitch lasted about four years and it's still kind of, it's there as a potential to continue, but again, throughout this process and the house building up north, it was again, giving time to other people's creativity, other plans, although still rooted in activism, and my own art was put to the side. And it's been life-changing having this opportunity to immerse myself in it. And uh, ironically, the pandemic kind of helps, even though it's incredibly negative as well. It's really good to hear, you know, about that side of activism as well, that, you know, it's like you do put yourself, like, you know, to the side and you put your practice to the side, you know, in order to bring up, like, other people. And um, so I'm glad because, I've you know, I've seen some of your work and been really fortunate um, to be in that position. And so I'm really thankful that you're, you know, now feeling in a position to be able to explore, like, more of that and really look forward to seeing, like, what comes, like, from it too. Um, and since the pandemic took hold, what has your experience of this crisis been? Well, in a, in a kind of basic way, for, like a lot of people, my main source of income has disappeared and become precarious in the extreme. It was mainly film, film industry-based, you kind know, of post-production, tech, uh, design, and uh, massage therapy which uh, was my route to financial stability. <laughs> um, technically, I could, I could still be massaging, but I don't feel safe doing that at all. And um, I do see it as continuing in the future at some point. But um, again, it's, it still all interrelates to my work, which, is, which a lot of is uh, body-based. And um, I mean, it's been... If an, I, did my diploma and finished last October and um, I've just been working on integrating that, integrating all the knowledge into my own daily practices and just having a new kind of insight, I guess, 
and merging that with my art practice, which has been a lot of breast work and fixing my own ailments because I don't have any clients and lovers and friends. And um, again, as, a, as an artist, it's also a way, about, a way about sustaining yourself and staying healthy. And um, it's also, it's highly inspiring, you know, and uh, supportive, again, in that practical sense of just deep breathing, stimulating the vagus nerve, which um, my workshop's going to go into this, which is one of the, it's the 10th cranial sacral nerve, and one of my favourites, and it interweaves through every organ in your body. And through deep breathing, you basically kind of relax your entire body. And um, singing and gargling helps too. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, art-wise, my, well, the entire scope of my project changed really because it was an interactive, central piece where you're going to be using all of your senses. But I, I, I much prefer making art where you can kind of touch and smell and feel things and um, be completely immersed and not cut off from it. So now it's, it's still, it's restrictive, but I feel it's pushing me as well. So now it's just involving um, sound, sight and uh, smell, perhaps if we manage to get space for this or whatever the future holds. And yeah, I think that was something that Jamie had said, you know, a lot of his work or his creative practice involved, you know, undertaking classes and that's just collapsed, mm -hmm. you know, completely gone. Um, and, you know, he was just saying as well, like he's quite thankful, you know, he's in a much more, he's in a better position to become adaptable, but it's, you know, adapting to what, you know, and you're already seeing like people that have rushed ahead and you know that are doing everything online now but you know as you've said like a, a lot of your work or you know your practice can't easily be transferred like online you know it's like you can't you can't undertake massage therapy you know online um and it's just a shame that you know in in a society that probably most needs touch at the moment you yeah. know it needs to be totally connected to our bodies and other people's bodies you know that's something that we're kind of being told that no absolutely not you know it's like that person or those persons like might be of massive danger like mm -hmm. to you um or you might be of danger to them so it's just yeah <laughs> what does the future hold i think related to that and again you know however you choose to answer this it's just how how have you encountered crisis both now or countered encountered and countered um crisis both now and in the past and how do you see yourself um remaking in a potentially continuous crisis-based future how do i see myself i i'm not sure what's going to happen so i think it's more focusing on pushing this digital aspect and again as this is where smell comes in as well but smell has been one of it smells very important to me, so I stay connected as well, and it kind of triggers memories for a lot of people. And um, I've, I'm, I'm still healing from concussion I had three years ago, and um, I forget a lot of things. I can, I can forget people in a few months' time. The smell is crucial to that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess having having that kind of digital resource, like being able to reread emails and things. Again, art wise and crisis pushing oneself. The the, bo the body has always been present in my work and as, as a root and a source of pleasure, but now it's become this dangerous site. But again, you can still you can have self pleasure, and um, in your bubble as well, which again that's one of the things that really sustains me is basically pleasure in all forms. You know, like cooking, stretching being able to sit in the sun and read, feeling the wind in my face. And majorly it's, um, it's just residency and being able to focus on art and um, being, able to see, being able to see my lover occasionally. And just having this space and time to think about things and process just quietly without this external pressure. I mean, I, I feel immensely lucky compared to a lot of people. Like, I, I don't really... I mean, although I, I'm precarious financially, it's like I, 
I'm comfortable for the next while. And again, that's just incredibly helpful to my art practice and just peace of mind. What I've found supportive during this whole time is, um, I guess, access to other thinkers and writers, specifically women of colour, and um, again, pleasure and uh, love has been immense. I always, I always used to create work when I was depressed or just feeling really anxious or stressed or upset. And that was my way. And uh, when I was happy, I would just go off and do other things. But now, for the first time ever, um, it's coming from a source of love and hope and optimism. And again, through accessing all these other writers. And it's been highly empowering because there's times where you can just think you're a bit weird and your beliefs, you know, it's like, I'm realizing that I am actually quite animist and um, it's not bizarre, you know, it's perfectly valid. And a lot of indigenous cultures have that way of thinking and living, you know, and I, and I just really do believe that love is the way through this, you know, it's like love for everybody, regardless of politics, you know, it's like we all started out the same. Loving the trees and every single crawling, flying, swimming creature, you know, in the earth. And again, that's quite often mocked and it's sad. It's incredibly sad, you know. And I, I spent years um, doing direct action and things and living in peace camps. And um, I remember at one big action, there was a group, I think, I can't remember what they were called. It was something like Orgasms for Peace or Wanking for Peace. And I remember being infuriated by them and uh, for days, I just, oh, yeah, I just, I just couldn't see how this was beneficial to this like, thing that people needed to have their bodies present at and their anger displayed. And, uh, and I get it now. <laughs> I mean, it still feels a bit hippie-ish to me, but I do understand it about um, pleasure and um, affecting change through, through yourself and, other people and causing ripples, spreading their love, as they say. God, it's something like a hippie. <laughs> I mean, and, uh, and also it's been interesting because uh, a lot of my friends have been turning to tarot and um, reading about witchcraft practices and kind of doing their own thing in that magical way and finding hope and love through that. And again, incredibly empowering. And again, something that's kind of laughed at and mocked. And it's this female power and energy and through this pandemic that like, women are affected the most and especially women of colour and it's something that people just don't think about I feel in this white western world you know it's the voice of the white male middle class that hits the mainstream and uh, anything different from that is just looked down on and mocked and it's tragic <laughs> We'll hit record and see what happens. Okay. We can't even do the testing. One, two. <laughs> one, two, um, one, two. One, two. One, two. So the next person we're going to be hearing from is Ruben San Roman, who is part of the Verbena Blue Collective, VBC. So it's a collective within a collective um, as part of Rotu. So we're actually doing this outside, so there might be quite a lot of background noise, um, but it's really nice. It's a glorious sunny day. Um, with autumnal vibes in At Queen's, Queen's Park. Park. At Queen's Park, the place to be. Um, so, I think it's always really good like for you to introduce yourself, um, who you are, what your work is, and where you're coming to um, from. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm Ruben, Ruben San Roman, as you said. Um, I'm a person related to theatre, so I've been working my way up, working with no many studies um, on the world of theatre and cinema. And yeah, for the Road to Experience, I decided <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the main representative for this collective. Um, the, collective the collective is formed by um, a group of professionals related to theatre as well and covering like different roles within within the project so um uh, we're trying to the main idea for the road to project was creating like um 
some kind of ecological awareness piece of theater and um, well with all this thing I mean like uh, COVID-19 the whole <laughs> the whole project <laughs> collapsed <laughs> so we've been thinking on we've been thinking on some way transfer it into a different format maybe so see what we can do um, uh, for the series of events we we've been creating a small audio walk around Queen's Park and it's funny how for example this project is been like a kind of conclusion after um, COVID a conclusion of uh, gathering all those experiences we've been feeling, reflections and yeah, experiences, reflections and feelings that we, we've been going through the lockdown experience and then basically the pandemic crisis. Um, yes, something like that. And then um, that I'm also... Yes? No, just that sounds like a very good intro. Cool. <laughs> and I'm also, uh, yeah, uh, within, it's maybe more related to the main project of Rotu instead of the instead of the series of events, but I've been finding on my way also a really funny fact, which is like I'm thinking subconsciously trying to mix and bond or putting together basically all the practical knowledge I've been gaining with the years and all the experiencing experiences I've been gaining with the years to some sort of gay birth to uh, something <laughs> <laughs> to this piece, piece of theatre which we're actually sitting in the arena at Queen's Park as well so it's maybe up in the skates skaters the, the skaters no theatre except skating theatre well, thanks for that introduction. I think that that really helps to place, um, especially, and it's something that's come up with other conversations I've had so far, just the differences that there are in the group and the different experiences. And I do find it super interesting that, yeah, you're part of a collective within a collective. Um, so since the pandemic took hold, as you were saying, you know, like your project collapsed because it was, you know, was a, yeah, piece of theatre. So p- theatre basically is no longer alive <laughs> at the minute. It's alive in the mind. It's alive in the mind. <laughs> uh, insane in the membrane. <laughs> and yeah, since the pandemic took hold, it's our initial idea was to work towards, you know, presenting something for COP26. Um, which was supposed to be taking place next month, and you know, that's that's no longer. Um, and now we are creating like a body of work, both collectively and you know individually, um, related to encountering crisis and remaking futures. So just thinking about that title, um, what has been your experience of this crisis, and any additional crises um, that are related to the pandemic or not? Yes, yeah, as, as, um, as we're showing in our recent project, uh, the thing on the series of events, um, um, well, we're basically showing that um, after the crisis, more than ever, I think human beings, we need to rethink and readapt our ways to some sort of ecological, either if you want or not, or maybe you're closer or not, to some sort of um, ecological engagement and um, in the professional or personal side of things how to readapt or redirect uh, our professional ways as well. I don't know if I'm talking all the time about professional but I think uh, everyone needs to live so (laughs) we need to I think we're stuck in a society or in a system that making money is one of the main aims. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point to what what the what the crisis has been bringing to us. So, thinking on readaptation on our professional ways, or for example, in my case, how we can talk about theatre when there is none. And in a positive way, how this new 
open, open, open forms of experimentation uh, are arising as we're founding obstacles, which I think it will be really cool on the, for example, in the side of theater, mm -hmm. to readapt or like create new formats or like yeah, like being able to um, uh, some sort of wider experimentation, which is gonna be crap in some ways, <laughs> I'm sure, but from all the experiments, I'm sure something it will be amazing. Yeah. It's gonna all like final products. I don't really like using that term either, but all final products go through like stages of experiments yeah. to get to that final yeah. product. You know, however, however you view a product. So think today. about it. For example, in the side of theater, they they may be like new things that we never thought about before. Mm. So new. New, new places, new forms, new adaptations, or new mixes, basically, of what we understand as theatre. Mm -hmm. Coming from uh, founding obstacles. Basically. And speaking of crisis and countering, or encountering crisis, um, how have you experienced or encountered crisis or countered um, both now and in the past and given that our futures especially at the moment feels like one that's filled that's going to be continuously filled with crisis um, how do you see yourself like making remaking and you know both professionally and pro professionally and Artistic, personally yeah. um, in the future um. I don't know, even if I, in the past, I needed a, some sort of challenge maybe to be able to focus onto something. Maybe it's due to my ADHD, how do you say that? ADHD? ADHD. <laughs> and um, I think uh, even if I've been blocked through a big gap, during the lockdown and the present crisis, it's been forcing me to try to look for new ways and rethink and basically say also saying to yourself like, okay, if uh, we need to, yeah, we need to look for an alternative. So um, I think in a way I'm trying to be bright and positive and it's the whole the whole thing has a really powerful, it, it has a lot of power to change things if we drive it in the right direction, I think. So I think going back to, you know, what you were saying there about maybe like feeling blocked at times, um, like both now, you know, during this pandemic or this particular crisis or again, like previous crises, um, what have you found has helped like support you to hold your imagination and keep your imagination and it's okay there's no sense to do I here. think for example <laughs> no with the road to projects they've been keeping me on the track in terms like uh, I've been having le deadlines to accomplish mm. and to yeah forcing me once again to get into a s some sort of oasis in the middle of the tempest <laughs> 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 so it's been a great Output, yeah, great output for me. So, the idea of Rotu is to put people into contact with art and making, creating alongside the practice of mm -hmm. liberation um, and building practical solidarity with today's struggles. And one of the main things that members of Rotu are encouraged to do is to explore their practice in a way that's, you know, liberating, provocative. I mean, that's the hope, of course. Mm -hmm. Liberating, provocative in centres like collective liberation. And I think just to go back to what you're saying as well, like experimentation. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Like, I basically say that already. Like, uh, I think it's a great point to... I think it's happening all, around, all along history, you know, when there is a big crisis, there is more creativity. Mm. So I think this moment, exact, this exact moment is going to be great for that. I'm not talking just in terms of my kind of area, which is theater. I'm, I think it's like everyone is going to 
and that's that's what it's about with human beings. No, it's always like resilience and try to overcome, even if we're fucked up at the minute, <laughs> but try to overcome on the next or to the next step. And how realistic do you think it is? Like. I'm going to be really assertive here. Okay. I don't think it's realistic <laughs> at all. <laughs> but we need to go for it and at least try. Can you... And it, I totally agree. And it's quite interesting because I think the previous conversations I've had so far, you're maybe the first one that said it's not realistic. Everybody has said, oh, it's realistic. But, um, yeah, I can see, like, both sides. Um, can you give any examples of like what we've spoken about um, in your, like during your time with Rota? Like of not uh, being realistic, you know, like all this kind Any, of approach. Or anything, like anything, how you want to read the question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think, for example, the fact of bringing art in the middle of this is so hard. It's like it's bringing art to the public, on, or for example, on remote places or... It's so, I've seen it like so surreal mm-hmm. in a way. You know, I don't see the, I don't see like the main marks to follow a path, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, the main mark. Imagine if you're like a kind of trip and then you need, to, you're reading your map and you need to look for what's your next, next station or your next, I don't see many. Yeah, usually signs there's like identifying of, markers yeah, of yeah identifying markers and see, being able to follow your your way or your path so at the minute for me that's quite uh, uncertain mm. so it's hard to and can you I think like a lot of the things that are spoken about with collectives are yeah, you know, collective power is like great, it's positive, you know, and it's only through collective action mm-hmm. that we can undertake like big changes. Um, but sometimes like the difficulties that arise of being part of a collective um, doesn't really get verbalised or vocalised, you know, it's not made visible. So I wondered if there was any like, difficulties that you'd experienced like being part of you know, a collective within a collective. Um, and if you'd feel okay sharing this yeah um, <clears throat> uh, talking from this, the the side of the collective our collective the theatre collective it's been quite hard to put people into contact so that's why I decided at the minute to be like a main representative and pass information on mm. to other members of the collective because I think it will be quite messy because I feel like it's the communication at the minute is quite messy in general between humans, sorry. So I think it will be make things so difficult, you know, trying to... So that's why I decided, I've, I don't know if it's a very strict way of doing things, but that's why in a way I decided at the minute take all responsibility and be more like the main representative mm-hmm. and then once we're working in a bigger or more collective or we got like more collective um, way of working it will be easier to pass this information back and forth so at the minute I think we're yeah we're, a, we're quite a few people so it will be quite um, yeah quite difficult to maybe create um and other representatives to cover different areas within the collective. So by the time you're trying to pass that information on to, let's say, like the rooty main head of whatever, it will be it will be quite messy. I find it's, I'm talking about I'm talking from the experience. It's, it hasn't been quite successful when we've been trying to explain to other people what our views are, blah, 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 even with our own members. Mm. You know, at the end, eh, everyone understand. Nobody understands you in full. <laughs> so, and maybe you don't explain yourself in full mm. as well. So that lost 
in translation, not translation, but that loss in communication can create a bigger, non-understandable way of... Understanding. Of understanding, <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, because that's something that you know has also come up, that you haven't met everyone. No, I haven't met everyone. Anyone. From the Rotary Collective. Um, no, just through the Zoom videos. Yeah. Just, the video, just through the, the computer. And do you think that that's had any impact or effect? I feel like, you, I mean, personally speaking, I feel, you know, it's like you're very, like, much involved, like, in the Zoom meetings and stuff and any mm. communications that we have. Um, but do you think that that's made a difference? Because we all went away together last year. and Yeah, but it was quite brief as well, no? Yeah, it was, it was very brief. I mean, like, it was quite brief. So I, I, I feel like I missed something, but... I could catch up with my charming personality. <laughs> you, make up, you make up for it in other ways. <laughs> I could catch up. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> I got a feeling from everyone, at least from everyone, at least, like, just through the video, just through the um, video calls, I think you can get, because at least you're not talking face to face, but you can see everyone's expressions. You can see, you can listen to everyone tone mm. on the voices. So you can also make your own reading about how people are. Or how people are. Yeah. Positives. What are some positives that you'd like to share? Positives. <laughs> I really enjoy. I really enjoy the variety of the the, the, the variety of people who are within the um, within the collective. I mean, when I say no, no, the theater collective. When I say uh, when I say the collective, when I, I mean Rotu, I think it's a great um, mix mix of characters. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's it's unbelievable. There's like it's, I, I think I mentioned that to you before, like the way. You've been gathering different <laughs> characters <laughs> within the same. Because it's great. I think we work together, you know. We, we, we really work together and it's been super random. Nobody knew each other from before, so it's been quite a magical kind of mix. Yeah. And do you, you feel know? yourself like being part of the collective like in terms of like your own personal self and your practice? Like, do you feel that it has been a space for you to be like quite free and again going back to like experimental mm-hmm. and provocative? Like, have you felt that that's the space that has been created? You know, that you don't need to. I think it's come up in a different conversation. Yeah, I think. Self-censor. I think that's that's what. Even if we, even if no all the members have um, similar approach to different views. Uh, I think I can express myself in the way I want, so I don't feel re- restrained. Mm. I don't feel restrained at all, ever. That makes me think also what I mentioned to you before. Like um, when I see myself, it makes me think about all the mental health issues that maybe people has been going through all this period, mm. or how new things have been arising, how new anxieties, new fears. <coughs> So, yeah, I think I I would like to flag in any of the work I'm doing also this kind of general paranoia (laughs) around everything because I think we're living in quite a big mix of non-understandable topics. Like people is just talking and talking and then we don't know which directions they really want to get to. Mm. So sometimes it's hard to read between lines, try to analyze, because people is not really in a good state. I'm not talking like everyone, but some people. This I've been found it quite hard to 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 read, or or even to myself. I've been going through so many like um, kind of blockage. Mm. Um, Periods or times where I couldn't, like, yeah, I couldn't even listen to myself, or I couldn't, like, 
understand my feelings, basically. Anything else? <laughs> Um, well, is there any sort of thing that hasn't been covered that you would like to to add or share? Mm-hmm. No, I think that's all. That's all. That's all. You guys need to listen to our project. It's, it's going to be great. I mean, you just did my I'm job really for looking, me there. I'm really looking forward. I'm really looking forward to it. Really excited. I think we've been creating something really, really nice and original in a way and um, fresh. Let's say fresh. It's been a, and it's been super random the way we approach to it. It's been super, uh, also quite um, direct. So I think you guys will enjoy it. Rubens was outside, which was quite nice. Mm-hmm. Last but not least, we're going to be hearing from Rotu member Fadzai Fudge Makwatuya. Fudge is an artivist and visual artist from Zimbabwe who is currently living in the Highlands, Scotland. So Fudge, um, how about you tell us a little bit more about yourself, who you are, where you're coming from and whatever it is that you'd like to share with, well, potentially the whole World Wide Web. Morning, Leila. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on what I imagine is a degrowth and a concept um, that Rotu wants to work towards as a collective. Um, I'm an artist, as you said, based in the Highlands on a little peninsula community called Scorridge. And it's interesting uh, living here because it sort of opened up a real experience of what degrowth could potentially look like. The community is um, self-sufficient, it's off-grid, and we pretty much have to um, sustain ourselves off the land and uh, a few people have polytunnels. And for me, that's sort of an example of where degrowth conversations um, can look at uh, for pilot um, ideas or ways that people are living that um, reduce consumerism. So, um, I do fine art, uh, mostly sculptures, paintings. Um, Artivist because my work encompasses a lot of social um, statements, mostly about Zimbabwe and my journey abroad and my experiences abroad. And I bring that to my work in sculptural pieces, mostly um, my signature technique in that work and the process includes charring um, found objects, uh, repurposing found objects in my artwork. So that's basically it. I mean, that's that's a lot. That's not basically it. But um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. I think it's really important um, for people to get a sense of where you're coming from, what's informing your practice, and particularly um, you're the only member of the collective who is living outside of an urban centre. Um, so I think that's quite important to, to place that as well. Um, so a few questions, you're getting the same questions that I've been asking everybody else, apart from maybe later on, we'll see what, what comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's impossible to, to talk about anything at the moment without talking about the pandemic um, and what people's experiences of that has been Um, because even though we are experiencing something that's global you know and worldwide in nature and the experience in which that is felt is different for everyone and so just going back to that you know uh, and what's come what's come through is that a lot of um the work that we were doing was disrupted and we were heading or working towards presenting work for COP26 
and then we move towards a programme um, related to encountering crisis and remaking futures. So just, um, I wondered if you could maybe talk us through, you know, your experience of the crisis and, well, if there's been any additional crises related to the pandemic. Um, and that can be like in any way, you know, personally, professionally, just how, how has the experience been for you? Well, <clears throat> the experience of the pandemic has had um, an impact on my lifestyle. Um, I feel very fortunate um, to have had the opportunity to move spaces where I lived. So I lived in Alapur, which was, which is a sort of urban community in the Highlands. And then when at the onset of the pandemic, we just thought, uh, wouldn't it be lovely to not worry about where to shop for vegetables or um, how to access groceries? And um, we then, the, decision to move to the house in um, on the peninsula. So then we began um, the search of hunt for what vegetables could we grow? Um, how could we uh, self-sustain through the lockdowns where there was the fear of how to access toilet paper, groceries, all that stuff. And um, we decided that, okay, we're going to go for this and really aim to, to live off the land. So we got three hens for our eggs and we bought some vegetables and planted them in the polytunnel. So we ticked that box of um, sustenance and food um, need and access. Um, in terms of work, it impacted on a lot of the sort of self-employed um, activities I'd undertaken. For instance, I was working in an art gallery uh, called Antalosolis in the Highlands. And this found um, the COVID experience meant that we had to shut down. So I couldn't go into the gallery to carry on the duties I was performing as self-employed. Um, so that was one impact. And then my, the other sort of work experience that was affected was giving workshops um, and holding exhibitions in different spaces because they too were shut down. Um, so we've all, in the arts scene, I think we've, moved towards or gravitated towards uh, showing our, our work online, which that's one learning curve that we've had to experience um, showing our work online and attending meetings online. However, that actually has been quite a good um, and a positive outcome uh, despite the now embraced technology and are able to communicate and hold meetings with people around the world. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being in meetings with people that I wouldn't, or, I wouldn't ordinarily have met. Um, so in a way, that's been quite pivotal to my art practice in that I can engage with um, other people and other communities beyond the United Kingdom. And health-wise, um, I feel I've had, you know, uh, mild symptoms and went through the mental crisis. If we're talking about crises, I feel that mental health has been the major um, impact on, on communities and people and individuals um, in any uh, sector uh, because it's a concern and a worry about um, surviving this pandemic. And fortunately we came through um, and managed to work our way through, towards a, a healthier being and 
it's made us more informed about how to keep ourselves safe and how to keep healthy and keep, you know, attention to uh, just our individual health. Um, so that's been my experience of COVID. It's also impacted in a funny way for me because I come from Zimbabwe and my family are all based in Zimbabwe. I live on Sparrow with my partner and my daughter, but I've got other children in Zimbabwe and parents, brothers and sisters. Um, that's impacted on holidays, planning on visiting each other. My kids were meant to come over. I was meant to go over. And that whole plan has been affected by um, travel. Uh, one has to feel um, safe enough to travel in an airplane. And most planes have been grounded. So that's sort of gone up the window. Um, yeah, so at the moment, I feel a little bit stuck in parts regarding traveling, but uh, we do online meetings as well. So that's quite good that they can access that. Thanks for that. And yeah, it's something that's come through in quite a few of the conversations we've been having like with the rest of Roto. Um, and incidentally, a conversation was having, I think this morning, was just, you know, when you mentioned there about, you know, the toilet roll situation, that was at the very beginning of our understanding of what, you know, a pandemic was going to look like for us. And that feels like such a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. But also at that same point, we were being told that we can leave our houses for more than 30 minutes. You know, and I'm just like, mm. <laughs> like what, again, like just thinking about longer term impact and particularly like on mental health, it's just, that does something to people, you know, mm. which we aren't addressing. We're still not really talking about. We understand that there's been, you know, increases in suicide, you know, mental health episodes, obviously domestic mm. violence. Um, mm. But yeah, we're still not really like kind of sitting like with that collective, you know, how is that going to look coll collectively? You know, it's just like, oh, well, mm. there's maybe one or two people or a couple of numbers that we might hear about, but how is mm. that going to impact on us, you know, collectively? Um, mm. And yeah, like just the start of the pandemic seems like such a long time ago now that maybe people don't realize like how difficult, you know, that period was and could have been and continues to be for, you know, vast majority of people. Um, yeah, which is what Oh, sorry. Uh, which is why Rotu has been so uh, meaningful to the collective because having an outreach to, mind, to similar minds and working as a collective uh, meeting every Monday has been really important to us because we can share um, this mental health dilemma um, instances of of uh, not being able to, to get out for walks, particularly for you guys living in the cities. I feel quite fortunate that I could roam around the peninsula um, and not meet another soul or socially distance even. Um, I feel my main panic is when I go into supermarkets, but that's been alleviated by ordering deliveries. Um, just like I said before, living off what we have here the house, um, growing our own veg and having eggs. So yeah, mental health wise, it is quite important to me um, that we find a collective solution to supporting each other. Mm. 